The January 1966 military coup resulted in the death of several top-ranking politicians and military officers. The casualties included Alaji Abubakar, the Prime Minister, Chief Festus Okote Ebo, Federal Minister of Finance, Alaji Amadu Bello, the Premier of Northern Nigeria, Chief SL Akintola, Premier Western Nigeria, Brigadier Samuel Ademolegu, Commander of the 1st Brigade, Kaduna, Brigadier Zaka Maimalari, Commander 2nd Brigade, Colonel Lagema, Commanding Officer, 4th Battalion, Lieutenant Colonel Yakubu Pam, Adjunct General, Army Headquarters, and Lieutenant Colonel Unegbe, Quartermaster General. As expected, the new military government suspended the constitution and banned political parties and political activities. In other words, all institutions of civil rule were at law. As head of state, JTU Agui Ronsi was also the commander in chief of the armed forces. Each region also had a military governor. Colonel Hassan Castina was governor of Northern Region, Colonel Odumegu Ojuku, Eastern Region, Lieutenant Colonel Adekule Fajiyi, Western Region, and Lieutenant Colonel David Edo for Midwestern Region. In this new dispensation, both legislative and executive powers were vested in the military government at federal and regional levels. The Supreme Military Council SMC, was the highest decision-making organ of government and the National Executive Council was the executive arm of government. The head of state was the chairman of both bodies. At the state level, the military governor was the state's chief executive. He also served as the chairman of the state executive council, which was the executive arm of the government. The governor made edicts which had the force of law just as decrees were made by the central government. The constitutional changes did not, however, affect the judiciary which continued to function as stipulated under the 1963 Republican Constitution. The greatest undoing of the Rossi regime was its decision to convert Nigeria into a unitary state through the unification decree of 29th May 1966. This led to riots and disturbances in parts of northern Nigeria and the killing of many southern Nigerians residents in the north. This crisis eroded the coup of July 1966, the second military coup in Nigeria. In Lagos, General Ironsi was being pulled both ways. He knew of the discontent of the North towards the idea of unification, but there were powerful advocates of it in his immediate entourage. On 24th May, he came off the fence. In a radio broadcast, he announced the constitution, suspension and modification decree. The provisions involved the abolition of the regions and their conversion into groups of provinces. Although with the same boundaries, governors and administrations. Nigeria would cease to be a federation and become, and become simply the Republic of Nigeria. The public services were to be united under a single public services commission but regional or now provincial. Commissions would continue to appoint all but the most senior staff. It then added that these measures were entirely transitional and should be seen as such and that they were made without prejudice to the findings of the Rutimi Williams Commission. Unhappily, that commission was working precisely on the problem of the relative merits of the federal and unitary system. It may well be that General Ironsi was seeking to placate the radical firebrands of the South who wanted reform quickly, while at the same time trying not to provoke the North by going too far. An examination of the unification decree, as it became known, shows that in fact it changed virtually nothing but names. Mokoni, this decree did no more than formalize the manner of government that had existed since the army took over and ruled through the Supreme Military Council, very much a unitary body. The unification decree was then used as the excuse for a series of most violent massacres of Easterners across the northern region. It started with a student demonstration at Kanu. Within few hours, 
it had turned into a bloodbath again. Although, as advocates of unification, the Yorubas of the western region had been almost the equals of the Igbos of the east, it was exclusively the Igbos and their fellow easterners that the northern mobs sought out. Shortly after the start of the demonstration in Kanu, hundreds of armed thugs swept across the space between the city walls and the Sabon Garis, where the Easterners lived, broke into the ghetto and started burning, raping, looting, killing as many men, women and children from the east as they could lay hands on. Any idea of spontaneity was dispelled by the spread of the riots. In lorries and buses, thoughtfully provided by unnamed donors, waved off former party talks spread out through the north to Zaria, Kaduna, and elsewhere. By the time it was all over, Nigeria was again on the verge of disintegration. Although no figures were ever published from either federal or northern government sources, the Easterners later calculated they lost 3,000 dead in those massacres. It may well be that some thought they were just demonstrating their feelings, which they had every right to do so. But the bushery that went with it, the degree of the organization and the ease with which it could be accomplished should have given warning of a deep underlying danger constituted a dark potent for the future. Again, the warning was overlooked. Many Northerners were probably quite convinced after several months of quiet indoctrinations that the Igbos really were trying to take over Nigeria to colonize the backward north and use their undoubted talents to run the country from end to end. Again, the secessionist demand of the north became an open issue, demonstrating civil servants in Kaduna carried banners proclaiming let there be secession. In the same city, Colonel Hassan called a meeting of all the northern emirs and many arrived with clear mandates from their people at home asking for secession of the north. In Zaria, the Emir was mobbed by crowds begging for secession. After the meeting, the Emir sent Ironsi a secret memorandum telling him, in effect, to abrogate the unification, the unification decree or they would secede. General Ironsi replied by going to great lengths to explain that the decree involved no changes of boundaries and that indeed it hardly changed the status quo at all. He pointed out that that it was a temporary measure to enable the army accustomed to a unified command to rule and that there would be no permanent changes made without the promised referendum. The MIs declared themselves satisfied. In June, Colonel Ojuku welcomed the Emma of Kanu, his contemporary and friend with whose aid he had been able to keep Kanu without bloodshed in January, as the new Chancellor of the University of Fusuka publicly called on his people to return to their homes and jobs in the north. Many of these Easterners have fled after the May massacres to seek safety in the east. Colonel Ojuku asked them to believe that these killings had been part of the price we had to pay for the ideal of one Nigeria. Throughout June, the Iran Sea government groped for a remedy to the problem of the rising tension in Nigeria, to none did it occur, and least of all to Colonel Ojuku that the Northerners might be permitted to fulfill their age-old wish and set up their own state. Eventually, General Ironsi left for a tour of the country to sound out local opinion on the broadest possible basis as to the future form of Nigeria that its people wished to see. He never returned to Lagos. Some of those seeking to explain away the coup of the junior army officers of northern origin in 29 July 1966 have suggested it was motivated by ideas of righteous revenge for the deaths in January of three senior army officers of northern beds. Certainly, prior to the second coup, there were growing cries in the north for the execution of the Mutinas of January, not as retribution for the death of the politicians whose passing remained largely unregretted, but for the shooting of Brigadier Mai Malari and Colonel Palms and Lajema. This argument is not convincing. Apart from these three, two Yoruba 
colonists and two Igbo majors were also killed in January. It seems far more likely that the key to the motives of the officers who mutinied in July is to be found in the code word that triggered the operation Araba. It is the outside word for secession and although there was undoubtedly a strong element of revenge inside the movement and the subsequent activities of its perpetrators. Their political aim was to fulfill the long-standing wish of the mass of the northern people and quite Nigeria once and for all. In this and in other points, the two coups were utterly different. In the first coup, there had been a fiery zeal to purge Nigeria of a host of undoubted ease. It was reformatory in motivation. Bloodshed was minimal for politicians and six um, officers. It was extrovert in nature and non-regional in orientation. 